Uh, ah, yeah, now it's uh, starting with the recording. Um, and you may use uh, the, the chat function to communicate with each other and to ask um, and to ask your questions. And the recording and the slides will be made available soon after the webinar on our website. Next, please. Yeah, and this um, webinar is mostly organized by ECLE Europe um, as the other webinars uh, within the Sintron project um, and um, the organization of this uh, webinar specifically was supported uh, by me and by Franziska Stölzel, um, who will later um, moderate the Q&A session. Yeah, just quickly about the Sintron project so that you know um, what we're doing there. So we are looking at um, four carbon intensive regions in transition in Europe. And those regions are either core regions or um, de highly dependent on another uh, fossil fuel, um, on, on another fossil fuel industry. And we're looking at the Rhenish mining area in Germany, Silesia in Poland, Western Macedonia and Greece. And um, Ida Viruma in Estonia. And um, we have uh, social, uh, so, social, political, um, focus there mostly using qualitative methods and analyzing how yeah the pace of the transition transformation can be um, uh, strengthened and increased, how the capacity to cope um, can be um, supported, and how those regions can adapt to the sustainability transition in general. And if you're more interested in the project, you could have a look at our coal transitions website. There you can find our latest um, publications and also upcoming um, events. Yeah, but now, uh, ah, yeah, and we also yeah, have this event series that I already mentioned, and we had several events also in the past, and there will be more upcoming events uh, in the future. And we, yeah, looking at different um, aspects of coal transitions, like for example, also youth engagement or how the war in the Russians war um, affects uh, the coal phase out, etc. So yeah, have a look at them. You're also very much invited to have a look at them. Yeah, but now I will kick off the, the topic and um, introduce you a bit why the gender dimension is important for a successful sustainability transition. And thereby I will, um, will refer to a report which was recently published by the Entrances Project. So next slide, please. Um, the um, Entrances Project is the sister project of the Sintran Project. They also look at carbon intensive regions in transition. They look at more regions, so 13 regions, not only um, four as we do, but they also have this um, yeah, social political um, perspective. And they recently published this report on the gender dimensions of the transitions in those regions. And um, I will um, yeah, very uh, broadly try to summarize their main results. So I don't won't go deeper into specific regions. And I also unfortunately don't have the time to go deeper into their methods. So if you're interested in that, you can have a, a closer look at the report. And I will focus on two areas which I think are useful <laughs> if you think about um, um, yeah, the gendered uh, dimension of sustainability transition. On the one hand, the um, differential gendered um, impacts of the transition, and on the other hand, um, the gendered agency of the transition. So next slide, please. Um, yeah, first of all, um, the differential gendered impacts of coal plus, so that's how I called it because I also include carbon intensive um, industries in general, so not only coal. Um, yeah, what are those effects? So um, yeah, the authors found that the direct labor um, market effect mostly affects men. This is also when you talk to people, they think, okay, they are mostly men um, working in carbon intensive industries, so they are affected and this is also the case they are those directly affected but um, when you look at the gender dimension it's, it's important to think about uh, like indirect and spillover effects of those and transitions um, and there might be for example this is what the authors say negative effects in other sectors like when the purchasing power in general is decreasing in a region then there might be negative effects um, in the service sector for example where mostly women work and so it's important to uh, not only set up 
reskilling uh, schemes, etc., only for those who were directly employed in those carbon intensive industries, but looking at the communities and looking especially at women in, in other sectors and at their needs. Um, and they found the authors that uh, more women entered the paid labor market in the course of the transition. Um, so they found this effect in, in all those um, 13 regions. And this, um, yeah, because traditionally um, in those regions, there was a very classical division of roles within households. So um, in those regions, there were traditionally a, yeah, a rigid role distribution, men as the breadwinner and women as caretakers, and also a quite pronounced patriarchal identity. And with the shrinking of the yeah, also very well paid jobs in the coal industry, more and more women entered the, the labor market. And this also then led to a redefinition of roles or still leads. So because this transition is still in progress. So we should have a look at those uh, effects on this uh, social identity and also the conflicts which could go along with those uh, impacts. Then they also found impact at the household level due, due to this, those changes in the labor markets. More and more women were then double burdened with paid and unpaid work because it's still in statistical, statistical fact, like um, sadly, that women do more unpaid work um, than men, unpaid care work. And so care infrastructure is also very uh, relevant in coal regions um, in transition to support um, those women. And what, what I also found uh, really interesting is that they, the authors of the report said that women in regions with a dependence on a male dominated Sorry? Ah, oh, no, okay. <laughs> uh, women in regions with a dependence on a male dominated economic sector are motivated to leave their regions in search of educational and um, employment um, opportunities because yeah, it would be good if there would be more women in those traditional, uh, traditional industry related economic sectors, but this is just not the case. So in all those case study regions, all those 13 regions, women work predominantly in the public care or social services sector and men in construction industry and transport. And so it's very important to also yeah, set up good working conditions in those sectors which are more interesting for women and where statistically just more women work and to have a, yeah, a diversified economic um, landscape and um, yeah, ensure attract um, attractive, good paid um, jobs also for women because otherwise they will leave and this will have a negative con or they are still already leaving like for example in the coal, all coal regions in, in Germany and um, this will have negative consequences on those um, communities. Um, yeah, next slide please. Um, yeah, and the other aspect of um, yeah, the other gender dimension of coal transitions, um, which is very clear to me, um, is this um, gendered agency in coal plus uh, transitions. So the question who actually decides where the region is, is heading, who is included in the, um, in the policy um, making. And here the authors found that uh, in almost all the 13 case studies, the share of male members in regional assemblies is significantly higher than that of women. So yeah, we need um, actually like parity in those uh, assemblies um, so that half of the population uh, can also take part in those decision-making. And they are mostly wealthy, well-educated men connected to the productive sector in those decision-making areas. The only um, case where there is like quite a parity distribution is in the Norwegian case uh, the authors analyzed. Then the renewable energy sector attracts more women than uh, the fossil fuel industries, but um, yeah, female employees are still in the minority and work mainly in administrative and low paid jobs. So there's also still a lot of things to be done. And what I also found quite in interesting, the entrances project, they also did a survey um, uh, it's not uh, statistically represented, representative, but um, still um, they had quite a nice a sample analyzing women's and men's opinion. And there women expressed more often that they expect positive economic outcomes as a result of the decarbonization process. And I found this aspect also very interesting. 
So next slide, please to wrap up. Um, yeah, we see that um, yeah, gender and other fundamental categories of social organizations, such as race, class, etc., they determine how people are affected by the tra transition and can, can participate. And so it's very important to analyze those categories with the gender sensitive analysis. And therefore we need gen more gender disaggregated data also with an intersectional um, perspective. And we should include those insights and, and uh, policy making and research. Yeah, this just was just very quickly my introduction to the topic, and it was also rather broad uh, on a more abstract level. And so I'm very much looking forward to go a bit deeper into specific um, regions. And there I'm very happy that we have Katarzyna Ivanska next. She's vice director at the Collegium Civitas in um, Poland, and she um, edited a very nice book, which I can rec very much recommend to read, Gender and Energy Transition Case Studies from the Upper Silesia Coal Mining Region. Um, and then next we have Oscar, I already, um, Oscar Vargas, I already mentioned it, he's from Colombia and um, published a very nice uh, book together with others, um, Outlooks from Below for Just Energy Transitions, Gender, Territory and Sovereignty. So we will also post a link Later, so I'm very much looking forward to getting some insights from coal mining areas in Colombia, where, where we are not yet at the point in time where we are phasing out uh, coal. Uh, so it's a very different stage, and I think it's important to have that in mind. Um, then we have Eva Kaskula, she's associate professor at the uh, Tallinn University. She will um, introduce us to some Cintron um, insights and research results. And then we have Francisca research associate from the University Flores, um, and she will um, moderate the Q&A later. So I'm very happy to uh, hand over to Katarzyna now, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Paula, uh, for this very nice introduction, um, which I might must say that it's very relevant. And thank you for uh, informing us about the the report uh, from the entrances project, uh, because uh, yeah, as I said, it's very relevant to um, all the all the well gender aspects that are um, researched by us, but also, and now I'm just trying to share my screen. Uh, yeah, that's the presentation. I'm. I'm um, but uh, I, I'm going to talk, and that's what our uh, discussion, I hope, uh, is about, is about um, um, the voices of women in Silesia, so about the nuances and some aspects of uh, this special region uh, in, in southern Poland. Um, I will try to be very quick because I know that I, I've got only uh, nine minutes already, um, but I also would um, uh, like to, to give the voice to women. So in the very end, I will just present you a short um, movie uh, for two minutes. That would be the all. Um, so um, why it is interesting? Well, you, you already know. In, in, and that was also about uh, the presentation that uh, lots of projects are focused on Silesia and on, on uh, Polish uh, um, energy transition or decarbonization process. It's not only about black coal, but the, the general energy transition. And it's uh, mostly focused on money or male aspects or aspects of, of gender, but in terms of um, whenever we talk about um, just transition, it is connected to the employment process and rather to the economic state and the state of the region than the aspect of people. So my perspective was very uh, focused on micro level. Uh, and here's the uh, paradigm uh, taken from the classical J James Coleman uh, diagram, um, uh, which shows the um, connection between macro uh, and systemic level towards and, and the connection between mic macro and micro levels. Um, so, so my research was um, very much uh, qualitative and uh, un sociological, as as you, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm sociologist, and uh, together with anthropologist and uh, yeah, yeah, 
qualitative researchers, we focused on a field work research in Katowice and the sub-region and the region of, of Silesia because uh, we noticed the gap, the, the um, uh, huge gap in, uh, in knowledge uh, of how women are tackling the change and why it's nearly invisible the, 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 the transition around the lives of women or gender transition. Well, I said invisible, but it's, it wasn't totally invisible because in 2015, um, the solidarity movement of um, the, with, 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 yeah, that still um, exists um, as a labor uh, as a labor movement um, or association uh, protested against closing the mines, and this is the uh, Warsaw uh, women from from working from uh, from Silesia region in mines in the mines and in the coal mines. Uh, as you mentioned, they, they are not miners. They, they work as services, as office clerks in the, in in connection because in the connection of of mining um, labor market, um, and they protested against uh, closing the the mines in Silesia specifically, but then the, the protests spread. So that was the inspiration because we thought uh, it's so interesting that the miners' wives and miners' uh, families and also miners' worker, wor workers from of the mines, women, have been activated and, and uh, uh, yeah, they protested against, uh, against the um, energy transition. Um, and we used, and I will be very short, I want to tackle this more, it's in our book, we used the ecofeminist um, scholarship, uh, so the perspective of how women um, uh, think about uh, environment and environmental protection and how they protect their lives and protect their, their families and how they um, understand uh, so-called ecology, so it's and uh, deep uh, and environmental concern. What are the environmental concerns? Um, we also were interested, and that was the first, uh, as I mentioned, first um, aspect of the activism. Uh, we, we in 2017 when we started our field research, um, uh, we focused on women activists who. Uh, yeah, that was again our aim to to find women leaders who work with within the environmental um, agencies. But it occurred that non there, there uh, were none non governmental organizations uh, that um, that were that were led by women. Uh, there were just men who <laughs> um, uh, uh, who led organizations, and mostly that was also in 2017 and 2018 visible um, that they are um, focusing either on just transition and on a political movement towards uh, uh, well, political. I mean, on a um, regional level um, towards um, proper transfer from mining system towards uh, the different kind of sectors, also in energy, preferably, and uh, uh, grassroots movements uh, working and fighting against smog and, and, bio, uh, and air pollution in the region, because that's also the region uh, where um, uh, there are the highest degrees of, of uh, air pollution. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned, uh, we focus on uh, uh, anthropological research, and we were uh, mostly interested in in the perspective of women and in the perspective of activists. And um, uh, here are the photos, some of the photos. I also at, at that time visited uh, uh, visited Canada, Alberta, specifically Alberta. Well, I saw I love Canadian oil and gas. Um, and uh, we should be proud of this. So this is exactly uh, a, a, the exact, uh, um, we could use this picture to, to show that uh, coal is an element of the culture, of the Silesian culture. And, uh, and here is the, one of the quotations uh, from, from quotes from, from our um, uh, women um, interviewee, who said, yes, I feel that it's a coal, an element of my culture, and we should be proud of coal. And that is the 100 years of a tradition. Well, it's not so long, I would say, but, but still this exists so much in our um, <laughs> Daggett would say petromasculinity culture, 
that um, uh, um, any kind of change needs a lot of support. And this support was given um, by, and I will just skip that, by, by, by us, by our, um, uh, just by asking questions, by just by looking for for women who are uh, activists and who are working in a uh, in in Silesian district on energy transition and on environment, because yeah, we our main focus, as I said, was environmental protection. Um, so um, there are three three types of narratives, and we found it after two years of research. So it's maybe just very very but generalized now. And, and sorry, but I, I need to simplify it for, for the sake of, of the time of this presentation. So one, one narrative is um, um, visible among, uh, let's say, middle-class women who say, well, uh, I need to focus on my life. This is my private life. And, and I, I, I have no public um, ambitions to, to work. So it's not my problem, not real issue now. Uh, I'm focused on on my ecological pro-environmental behavior, and that's what I can afford only. Um, the other part, um, narrative is uh, focused on um, pragmatical perspective, and this is younger generation, especially uh, um, minors' wives present this narrative, who say, well, who try to. Um, uh, use the situation, as they say, and and uh, prolong the energy transition so that um, um, at the moment uh, they believe that this is the only time, and that was like a longer period, as I said, yeah, to, yeah. 2017, 2018, 19, um, pragmatical perspective that, well, the transition maybe uh, will occur, but at the moment I just want my family to work in this sector because this is something that, that uh, this is our tradition. Yeah? And the last uh, part, and this is uh, very in, in, interesting because it was also um, represented by minors um, wives, well, older generation of, of minors, uh, wives, and uh, now no, I know 10 minutes has been finished, um, the kind of consent to change. So the, the, they, they believe that uh, the change already, uh, the change of the energy transition has already started and it will be even worse for them. Uh, so they just need to uh, change their lives. And this change of lives is becoming um, a nuisance for them because th that's what, what the report from Entrance also says, because it means that uh, men are not only breadwinners, because women are still, uh, in, in, in Silesia there is also um, matriarchy, it's not only patriarchy, patriarchy is in terms of the um, breadwinning, but in terms of the money, but in terms of the uh, decision making by women who take uh, actions and and families into their hands because they just had to because their father the their families the male males in their families decided to, well they had just were um, unemployed um, yeah have, one of our it's people, nearly done Katarzyna. okay just one just okay yeah. so uh, so the transition has been uh, has been done and uh, two minutes I will just give the voice to newborn women activism because I think this is the crucial and the most interesting for us so so if you could just leave me uh, leave uh, two minutes for for my uh, for my informants w fundacji rzecz społeczna jestem z Chorzowa a pracuję na terenie całego Śląska. Działam w sieci organizacji Bankwatch. Bo się nie mogę oddychać, ale mam też taką potrzebę krzyku i mówienia wszystkim, że wokół nas jest taki cichy zabójca, ponieważ jego nie widać. Czuję, że zabiera mi się poczucie bezpieczeństwa. Smog odbiera mi prawo do tego, żebym spędzała swój wolny czas tak, jak mam na to ochotę. Ryzykuje się moje zdrowie. Ja pamiętam od dzieciństwa zawsze był to problem przez niemal pół roku. Musimy być ostrożni, sprawdzać, czy możemy wyjść, pobawić się, wyjść na spacer, spędzić czas z najbliższymi. Boję się wychodzić na spacery ze własną córką, że boję się o jej zdrowie. 
że myślę o tym, jak wiele dzieci ma problemy z układem oddechowym, jak wiele dzieci ma różnego rodzaju alergie, jak wiele dzieci ma astmę. Jak... Okay, and these are the motives and main incentives for women to act. And even with the pictures and the, and, the, and the videos and our research was done before pandemic, and the pandemic has changed a lot in all over the world, uh, in all, also in our mindsets. Uh, but I would say that it is a kind of sinusoid of the sinusoidal uh, transition also among empowerment of women, which must be helped. And that's all. Thank you very much. Sorry to be longer. Thank you very much, Katarzyna. Um, very insightful. Um, so I will quickly hand over to Oscar. I already uh, yeah, introduced you, but you can also say some more words about you. And I'm yeah, looking forward to your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Paula. And thank you, Katarzyna, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, as Paula said, my name is Oscar Vargas. I'm from Colombia. I'm a project coordinator at the Red de Iniciativas Comunitarias, Community Initiatives Network, uh, among other different hats I wear in my everyday life. I We can go to the next slide, please. I uh, was the main author, or rather I, I led a research team of uh, 13 uh, colleagues, um, which were which came from academia, activism uh, and several uh, social uh, social territorial leaderships um, in coal intensive regions uh, to create the book gender territory and sovereignty bottom up impulses or bottom up outlooks for just energy transition. Uh, the process was created with uh, up to 80 women in four indigenous uh, Afro and peasant communities in La Guajira, Cesar and Boyacá, which are four uh, coal intensive regions uh, in Colombia, so coal bearing regions. Um, and uh, we developed this research around three cross-cutting thematic axes, which came from the literature that is uh, Southern epistemologies, feminist uh, epistemologies, especially from, from the Latin American perspective, which are gender, territory, and community sovereignty, which we see as three intersecting axes, which uh, play a key role in uh, energy, just energy transition discussions. I will just be uh, focusing on gender, but I wanted to name this three dimensions so you know this is part of a much uh, larger effort. And the idea was to, from there, provide uh, some recommendations for uh, policymakers on three types of transition. The mining extractive transition, on the one hand, that is closing the mine. Energy democratization, which means ensuring uh, uh, electricity, access to, ele to the electric service for, for everyone and, and at an accessible rates, as well as a broader and just a transition in the sectors of education, uh, industry, and, and ensure that this is like a truly uh, all-encompassing uh, effort. Um, quick, uh, quick thing is that we, like we uh, analyze four different communities that respond to two different kinds uh, of coal mining, large-scale mining regions in Cesar and La Guajira, which are in the north of Colombia, which are capital intensive, uh, but not labor intensive, and small-scale mining, which is uh, shaft, deep shaft mining uh, in, the, in the interior of the country. So in the Indian region, which are labor intensive, but not uh, capital intensive. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and while I will try to be doing uh, in these uh, next couple minutes, is uh, focus on a couple of different dynamics of how uh, mine, of coal mining has seeped into uh, communities from a gender perspective, but also to understand women not only as the key victims of coal mining, which they are, but also as the key agents of change and the key people that we need to include in just energy transition. So that's what I will try to do through this very simplistic uh, use of, of red and green. So in terms, for example, of job insecurity, which relates to gender-based violence, we see on the one hand, these patriarchal norms, I'm starting on, on the top to the left, this, we see these patriarchal norms that hinder women's access to jobs in the mining sector. This, this is a male controlled uh, sector, which pushes women either to the households or to alternative economies, watch one of which is uh, prostitution and even sadly the sexual exploitation of children in the immediate influence area of the mind, which of course has very negative implications in terms of gender-based violence, both in terms of remaining in the in the 
remaining economically dependent to men, to men in case they are in the domestic sphere or to men outside, you know, due to, due to their uh, occupation within prostitution. Uh, and this, of course, relates uh, to perceptions of toxic masculinity related to mining, which Katarzyna already mentioned as uh, petromasculinity, which we also see uh, in this cold region, so which, which uh, takes uh, place in popular culture, uh, popular music, uh, which justify uh, and even enshrine misogynistic attitudes of the coal miners just on the grounds that they have the money, they can afford many women, uh, and so on and so on. In case you didn't see me, I did the air quotes. <laughs> uh, and of course, this increase in gender-based violence uh, creates fear among women to associate and to stand out on the sheer fear of, of being killed, which is you know, a very common thing in, in Colombia and Latin America, which has the highest femicide rate uh, worldwide. At the same time, but once this, we, we, we take this very negative impact uh, to one side, we also understand or women, women told us how this isolation of women in the domestic sphere also led to reduced exposure to Western cultural values and thus to a greater affinity with their own territory and with their own ancestral values. This is something we need to understand is, is in these territories, we have mostly indigenous, Afro and campesino women, that is. Uh, women that 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 uh, stem from ancestral cultures and which have a very very specific and different relation uh, relationship to their territories than than we do in the Western uh, sphere, and this uh, greater affinity leads to them better better positioning themselves as guardians of their own territory uh, and guardians of their own ancestral knowledge, which includes issues of uh, questions of medicine, questions of agriculture, questions of how to take care of their territories from a large scale coal extraction. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, another issue that Katarzyna mentioned, respiratory and cardiovascular diseases in children. Um, we see a, an, equal, an unequal distribution of childcare work between men and women due to both the isolation of women in the domestic sphere that we just discussed, but also the heavier incidence of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases that especially uh, affect children under five years of age. And of course, this leads to two negative outcomes. On the one hand, either time constraints among women for other activities because of the fact that they're taking care of their sick children or the elderly, uh, which include community leadership and activism, or even uh, the death or illness of their own children, which again, disproportionately affects uh, women creating. Uh, at the same time, however, the, the rage and the motivation for these women to enter struggles in defense uh, of the territory, which, you know, conflicts, uh, which is this other issue of how, how time constrains that, that ability to, to enter into the territory. So this, is, this isn't clean cut, you know, we, we see contradictions and we see conflicts all throughout this different, this different chains of events. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, we now look at a different side of the coin, that is how, how positive and, and uh, active intervention on behalf of women creates, again, some negative consequences for them. Um, on the one hand, this positioning of women as guardians of their territories, as well as their own ability to articulate in their own communities, to, to bring people together, brings them to articulate, to create collectives and networks, and to mobilize their entire communities against uh, the miners has been done in the south of, of La Guajira department, which then again uh, comes with uh, a spike in violence, both gender-based but also political violence uh, exercised through paramilitary groups, some of them in, in alliance with some of the mines, uh, coming to selective assassinations and intimidation of women as the main spokespersons of this social movement, uh, as well as the active exclusion of women from consultation and decision-making spaces, which was something that, that Paula was, was, was also mentioning to some extent. Uh, and the logic, and this is a very explicit logic that, that the mine and, and, and um, the public sector uses, is that it is easier to negotiate with men. Men are more exposed to Western values. Men are more inclined to understand the economic value of the territory, assigning rather an economic value to the territory while the women um, still like hold on to their ancestral values and seeing the intrinsic value of nature, the territory and human life, of course. And of course, that in a way leads to, to, to further limiting their activity and then an expansion and or continuing of the mining activity, then again, starting the cycle. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. 
uh, just this is a very specific case that I wanted to showcase. The, the other ones are a bit general from the different cases that we collected. This is a very specific one uh, that happened uh, at the beginning of last year is with um, through, through the legal struggle of one of the women's collectives in La Guajira, the case arrives at the Colombian Constitutional Court. That, that is with, with a Sarrejón Coleman. And the Constitutional Court rules that this company must carry out maintenance in water reservoirs in neighboring communities, among several other measures to safeguard uh, the local community from the impacts of coal mining. And this company, interprets the, the ruling as clearing out all surrounding trees from the water reservoirs uh, in agreement with local authorities through some sort of deal, uh, but against what the local women's collectives uh, wanted, who knew that it is the tree roots that help collect the water and ensure the water stays in place during the summer. That goes then to summer rolls in and the reservoirs completely dry out and domestic animals such as goats begin to lie to die in, in large quantities, affecting the local economy and food security, especially for women, which, as we knew, are relegated to the domestic sphere and are thus responsible for keeping uh, these domestic animals. Uh, and thus, as a consequence, uh, women collectives in the community get organized, collaborated with us and with other NGOs and local government institutions to plant and tend to native plants around the reservoirs. So this is another chain of how <laughs> this interplay of, of struggle also on the legal level um, has negative consequences on the territory and then again uh, loops back into how these women are getting organized and becoming agents of a social transformation. I will be I will finish with my last slide please. Um, okay no this is um, yeah okay the, the previous slide was just real quick some some quick uh, relations between different acts of oppression and different acts of resistance that we can skip over. You can like check it out later in the presentation. And the main conclusion that I want to reach here is that women are definitely the most affected victims of coal extraction in Colombia, but at the same time, they are also the most important agents for a just energy transition. And, and this is something that I see as well in Paula's presentation and in Catarcina's presentation. Uh, and not only in terms of preserving their territories, they're the ones who know how to do it, but they are also the people that, that, because they haven't been in contact with the mine or Western industries, know how to switch back to alternative economies. And with that, I don't only mean agriculture and ancestral practices, but also they are the ones who know how to innovate, how to create new industries, because that's what they've been doing to survive for the past decades. And finally, uh, a quick appeal is that this discussions on just energy transition in Europe must consider its impacts on women in the global south. We know how, for example, uh, Germany is currently being uh, ramping up its, its uh, purchase of coal from Colombia to survive um, the war and not having gas from, from Russia. So this is, this is another side of, of the discussion that we cannot ignore when we're talking about this subject uh, in Europe and, and in other developed countries in terms of just energy transition. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. Very, very interesting and um, yeah, very important uh, relations that you just uh, mentioned at the end. Um, so I would now um, hand over to Eva. Hi, and thank you very much. Um, I will just present a tiny piece of um, some of the analysis that we've done for the Tintram project, and that is to do with um, the division of household labor, reproductive labor in um, in the Tintron regions. Um, this analysis is done together with my colleagues, uh, Arina Ale Alexeva and uh, Annela Anger Kravi. Next slide, please. Um, so um, I'll kind of echo what, uh, what Oscar was just saying, that women can be seen as victims of the energy transition, but also have the potential for emancipation but uh, we know in the coal um, uh, mining regions there are often these very very rigid uh, gender roles um, at least you know these are the stereotypes of uh, male breadwinners and female homemakers so something we've been trying to explore is uh, what happens uh, with the division of labor uh, with the decline of mining, and as uh, Paula mentioned, you know, uh, it can lead 
to actually a double burden for for women, but it could also be um, an opportunity for redistribution of some of the host household chores. So, you know, besides looking at the big um, economic events and the macro level, we can also see um, that the, um, the transition would have to be, uh, can only be just when, when there's this kind of redistribution or reviewing of, um, of household labor as well. But um, um, to, to, to understand that, we need, need to know a little bit more about what is going on at the moment and traditionally. Next slide, please. Uh, I just, uh, we came up with um, general models at the moment and very often when we ask people whether, how the household chores are divided, you can, uh, people said, yes, you know, the wife deals with children, all the emotional labor of organizing everything, cooking, um, and while the husband tends the, the garage or um, does the repairs. And uh, here's a quote from a homemaker in Poland who says, yes, for the 14, 15 years that I've been at home, uh, I deal with everything, um, also the financial matters, but he earns the money and makes payments. Next slide, please. And uh, very often it comes with a particular kind of financial division of labor that uh, males um, bring the house, uh, the check home and the rest is women's. And here is just a very telling interview situation from an Estonian miner. And uh, the interviewer is trying to find out uh, how much do you actually pay for, um, for the rent, for utilities. And he says, well, to tell you the truth, I don't really know. Um, I give it to my wife and uh, she pays it and no i don't know how much the utility bills are uh, i give her money and uh, um, it, i give her about 500 euros and i don't know if it's enough uh, i guess it is so they very clearly say that you know this money is enough and this is a woman's job to deal with financial matters and uh, next slide please so these were the groups of people and they were quite generally um, similar in, in Poland, Estonia and, and Germany, which is the data that we looked at. Uh, and now if, if there's another model, uh, it is people who respond to the question, like how, how are your um, chores divided in a way that, okay, it's actually not such a clear division. You know, uh, we do everything together, it's equal. But when you start digging a little bit deeper, um, in the first quote, there's a Polish female mine employee who's actually also the main breadwinner. Her paycheck is higher. And she says, no, you know, my husband can do everything at home. He can do well in the kitchen. But of course, when I am present, it's I that do it to, you know, look after children. So it's... Uh, you know, in, in principle, in theory, the men can do everything, but not necessarily in practice. Or another quote from Estonian uh, miner who says, yes, you know, if there shouldn't be a division between who's the wife, who's the husband, it's unethical to a human. Um, but, um, uh, well, so you do everything together. Of course, well, she cooks. I wouldn't meddle with it. I trust her. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I just want to point out that there are also other household structures when we start thinking that it's not always um, uh, men and, and women living together. But next slide, please. Uh, and just why people say that it is so, uh, that this kind of division of labor where women do more of the household chores is justified. Very much it's uh, about um, the description of how hard the underground work is. And this is often justified. They don't pay money for nothing for me. It's so hard work that I can't possibly do anything in the household when I come back. Next slide, please. Um, and this is something that I kind of would label um, petromasculinity, Eastern European style. Um, and this is, a, again, a longer quote where the interviewer is asking uh, about the monthly income and uh, the, the young man who used to work in the mine but has now left says, 
no i just have 700 euros left after the bills uh, uh, that's why i don't want to um, uh, get married because i can't support the family and the interviewer kind of timidly goes uh, well but you know if you'd have a wife she would also bring an income and he goes i'm not one of those people for equal rights i don't feel good about equality i don't feel good about all these minorities the interviewer says well a wife is not a minority and he goes on explaining that these European values about um, uh, sexual minorities or gender roles uh, are not acceptable to him. And he will really want his wife to be a homemaker. And this is a relatively young person. Next slide, please. Would you soon come to an end, Eva? Uh -huh. Can we actually go to um, the conclusion slide? Um, there we go. So just the, the main insights that uh, if we look at models, um, there are these uh, households that say that um, they, they share labor equally, but actually women seem to still be doing more, even if they are working or even if the men say that the labor is equal. Um, and, uh, and, and actually we, we see that, you know, what people say they do is different from what they actually do. The main justification to these cultural norms that we have to consider uh, why this division of labor remains is that people believe that underground work is super hard and also particular cultural values of, of um, you know, male dominance. And uh, when people said uh, what might happen in the future if they retire, we see that in um, families where men retired, they actually did more of the housework. but. Uh, Many of them also said that, no, I will still lay the tiles and she will still be in the kitchen. So mixed, mixed results, but, uh, but this is something that we have to consider that these values are present in the region. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, so now I would like to hand over to Francisca so that we can uh, yeah, deal with some of the questions. Actually, we're... So actually, we were thinking about to just wrap up a little bit what we are, what we heard, because the time um, is running out and we also want to um, open the floor for some new um, events or for some upcoming um, events from Sintran and uh, ECLE. But of course, um, if you are, if you have questions or if there are any um, thing you want to add, you can write an email to the ECLI team, um, Julen, on maybe you can also put your email address in the chat and he will um, send the emails to all of the other um, present presentationers and then you get back your um, answered questions in a couple of time. Um, what I can say is that, of course, the um, most theoretical um, lecture we got right now <clears throat> is also um, a really big theme in the practice and also in on site in the coal mining regions. Um, for example, where I can talk ages about is here where I'm from, from the Zeysia, Eastern German coal mining region where we have the same um, problems and we can, uh, we can um, determine different um, stationers or um, different kind of practices in the different countries all over the world. But we can also see that there are a lot of similarities of women or um, minorities in general in the different coal mining regions. So I am really thankful for everyone who presented today. I'm very sorry for all the questions that can't be answered here in the, in the webinar anymore, but I want to um, open the floor for um, Franco who will um, present some of the um, Francisca, we, yep. we still have time for, for questions, so I just need one minute to say about the event. Oh yeah, that's also great. So, so I mean, that's the less important thing. Let's. 
discuss a little bit more. Okay, so um, I can't see any questions in the in the chat, but if there are any questions right now that are upcoming, Katarzyna, you already raised your hands, which is, so uh, go ahead, please. Yes, well, I, I can see that on the chat there is nothing, but I'm very interested. Well, thank you for for, uh, for for this all the speeches and thank you thank you for organizing this this meeting with um, Eva and Oscar. Uh, yeah, that is that's so interesting to compare um, Poland or CE countries and and global South well, Colombia, um, but. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, uh, even if we can see the variety of, 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 of um, uh, comparative studies that we could uh, that we could use about gender and like, for example, the paradigm of petro masculinity, I would say, and that's as, as I started with that the, the nuances are so much important. As you, Oscar, mentioned, um, uh, well, we all talk about fears of women and uh, like traditional perspective that women should be um, at stayed at home and she shouldn't be active and the, her agency is um, limited, uh, especially in public life. But in private, she is uh, she she is very much um, uh, active and and she can make a change, especially when she is uh, uh, worried. Yeah, in Poland about the health of her children and and she must she wants to secure that. Um, but the, what what. I think it's most interested is that uh, women are, for me, uh, women are victims. Um, victims in terms of also sexual uh, assaults and and victims in terms of I, I understand that also in public life due to the like traditional um, uh, structural division. Uh, so this, do you have an analysis of how women? Can fight with it, and how how uh, well women or organizations, and also I understand that your research is also to show that that they need more much more help to, to uh, help in, in in this. And on the other hand, the Eva, you meant well. I would say that Estonia is so close to to Poland, but you also have done comparative studies. And my question is about the pandemic. How pandemic has changed and. I, I'm, I'm not sure I missed that information about when the research was done, whether it was in before or after, because I my hypothesis is that the pandemic, um, uh, well, I mean, the transition was very much um, wiggling and it was it was running very, very fast before the pandemic, but then pandemic has changed the, the also the empowerment of women because they, they just focus on the again on their private lives and, and households etc and now and uh, now uh, the, the the role must on, go on but the changes must be supported again um because women probably uh, are focused on different uh different sectors of their lives that's my hypothesis and i would be very willing to discuss this with both of you or yeah the others <laughs> Maybe we can also go back um, one second for um which is also um really close to what you said um Anna Janssen just asked um as women do not have so much agency at home and in politics do you think that is why they lean towards social movements um thus Oscar, you want to say something? Yes, I do. That is a fantastic question. Oh, yeah, that is a fantastic question. And it's definitely something that we looked into because most of the social women that, that we could find in both Cesar and La Guajira are led by women and not only led by women, but are made up entirely by women. And that's not to say that there are no activists who are men that, that, that protect the territory and that are against mining, but the patterns of, of interaction are very different. We saw that men tend to act more on their own as, as individuals and they're fairly well connected. They have good rela relations with the mind. They're, they're, they're in a good position to, to exercise some sort of uh, influence. They are uh, included in decision-making spaces as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, but they do so mostly alone. Whereas women tend to band together like most collectives that, that are recognized in that are again uh, made up by women. 
And, uh, and we ask that question specifically because we were, we were curious about it. And, uh, and the answer really blew us away. It's, it's because, or at least in their mind, it's, it's because of these uh, ten, but like both this relegation in the domestic sphere that, that caused them to actually get to know each other in their communities, but also what they describe as a natural tendency towards creating bonds and structures, towards so actually creating communities uh, even beyond the struggle. You know, these these are women who are friends who, who join together, who, who are actually uh, creating the community that could emerge after uh, the coal mining. So that's that's a, that's a huge question, and that's um, yeah. I mean, it, and it's sure they they're also excluded from other spaces, but but it's not only negative. It's also a very, very positive and very active role that women are playing in creating these collectives and communities. Thank you, Oscar, for this um, really short um, answer of a huge question. Um, Ayesha also asked about um, the inequalities in job or household that you already mentioned uh, wouldn't transfer into new energy regime, which you also already answered, Oscar. But if there are any more suggestions on that, you can go ahead for one minute and then we will uh, give the um, floor to Franco. Um, I would just comment on uh, Katarzyna's hypothesis. If uh, I didn't see much, I mean, I, I can tell you best about the Estonian case um, that COVID hindered something. I mean, maybe some very small projects of activating women were done more on Zoom. And this was rather described as a positive event that um, women who were not computer literate before were actually at least you know learning to to use zoom and 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 have these gatherings nevertheless but i think um the certain breaking point at least in the estonian cases is the war and the energy crisis and might be kind of first of all it split the estonian society very strongly um the mining region is mostly russian speaking and people did not always want to gather in the same way and also it kind of, I think, affects the household chores because the mines are now working 24-7. Uh, so the husbands are even less at home. So, so any kind of progress that might have been made there is, is uh, currently halted. Francisca, if I can answer the question in the chat real quick about renewables. Uh, that is a risk, of course. It is a risk that the new renewable energy, the new renewable industry will come in and perpetuate the very same problems that, that coal mining has had on these territories. But this specific question, like, we need to be careful of, of not perpetuating also the argument of why women are in the coal sector. So they're not educated, that they don't have the skills, that they're not strong enough. Uh, especially because in the renewable sector as well, yes, it's more technical, it, it, it demands a higher education, which is in some cases is, you know, it, we're not there on par uh, men to women in terms of education level, uh, but also requires a set of skills that, that the miners haven't traditionally developed. Again, as I said, I mentioned just like the Zoom skill. Uh, or, or, or several other things that these women have had to adapt to either through their social movement story, uh, history. Or, or through their own uh, process. And the men will also need reskilling and upskilling to, to enter into this new industry. So that shouldn't have to be an argument, but it is definitely a concern that we need to include women in this transition as well. Thank you, Oscar, for wrapping it up so quickly. Um, so thank you all for your presentations and for the time you spent with us about this really important um, insight of uh, another insight of coal mining and um, energy transition. And now I give the floor. Yeah, I know that we are in two minutes already past of, uh, of the time that we said, so I'm just going to be quickly 30 seconds. Um, apart like from these uh, webinars at ECLE, we are uh, as part of the capacity building program. Uh, we are running this Sintran Academy event that is going to be in Estonia. It's open for externals. We are going to fund uh, approximately 20 participants, accommodation, travel and food. So please, if you are interested, 
I think Julian is gonna, yeah, he sent the link in the chat. You can apply before the 7th of April. It's just two questions. It's gonna take five minutes to apply. So feel free to do so. And it's gonna be the 9th and 10th of May. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share is uh, this uh, report from the World Bank, uh, again on the topic, uh, a feminist approach for the coal sector. Here are the links of a blog, like a short version, and then the, the long version of the report. And the last thing, it's going to uh, an event on Thursday as well on on the gender energy transition, you know, way. So, and also uh, Julian is going to send the link in the chat. So I think that's it. I don't want to steal more of your time. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us to this webinar and also to our speakers. Wonderful presentations. Everything is going to be shared. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so yeah, and also feel free to, to send us uh, the questions that uh, were unanswered so then we can forward it to the, to the speakers as well. Thanks a lot and have a nice day. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank Cheers. you.